First aid is the immediate care given to the injured or suddenly ill person. It is temporary assistance that is rendered until competent medical care, if required, arrives and takes over. Emergency first aid means dealing with urgent conditions. This program has been designed to help provide basic information that will help you properly apply first aid that can save lives, reduce recovery time, and can possibly be the difference between temporary disability or lifelong disability for the victim. A life-threatening emergency exists when a person is not breathing, the heart is not beating, or there is severe bleeding. In these cases, death may be only a few minutes away unless treatment is given immediately. You've probably heard of the Good Samaritan Law. It varies from state to state, but generally it protects you from liability as long as you act in good faith, are neither reckless nor negligent, act as a prudent person would, and only provide assistance that is in the scope of your training. You must not abandon a victim once you have initiated care and you cannot accept anything in return for your services. This training program is designed to provide information you can use to help victims. If you are the only person at the scene of an accident or you are required to assist others, if you know basic first aid, a victim's health and life may very well depend on your ability to react properly, make a quick decision, and render an appropriate level of first aid until emergency medical personnel arrives on the scene. Over the many years, experience has demonstrated that proper first aid training can save lives. The more you know about first aid, the better you will be able to respond in case of an emergency. When a person is injured or under great stress, the body system for circulating blood may fail to provide enough blood to all of its parts of the body. This condition is called shock and it may accompany any serious illness or injury. Treat every accident victim for shock no matter how minor the accident or injury may seem. Have the victim lie down and raise the feet slightly. Eliminate the cause of shock, control the bleeding, restore breathing, relieve severe pain, treat any wounds. Place blankets or coats under and over the victim to prevent loss of body heat. Make sure the airway is open for breathing. Be prepared to give cardiopulmonary resuscitation if necessary. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation is a life-saving technique useful in many emergencies including heart attack or near drowning, in which someone's breathing or heartbeat has stopped. Ideally, CPR involves two elements, chest compressions combined with mouth-to-mouth -mouth rescue breathing. However, what you as a bystander actually should do in an emergency situation really depends on your knowledge and comfort level. The bottom line is, it's far better to do something than do nothing. Remember, the difference between your doing something or doing nothing could be someone's life. Here is the latest advice from the American Heart Association. Untrained. If you're not trained in CPR, then provide hands-only CPR. That means uninterrupted chest compressions of about two per second until paramedics arrive. You don't need to try rescue breathing. Trained and competent. If you are well-trained and confident in your ability, then you can opt for two options. One, alternate between 30 chest compressions and two rescue breaths. Or two, just do chest compressions. Trained but not confident. If you've previously received CPR training, but you're not confident in your abilities, then it's fine to do just chest compressions. If you determine a victim has an obstructed airway or is choking, it may be necessary to remove the foreign object from the airway. Perform the Heimlich maneuver by standing behind the victim, wrap your arms around the victim's waist, press your fist into the abdomen with a quick inward and upward thrust until the object is expelled. Cardiopulmonary resuscitation, when properly performed, provides artificial circulation and breathing to a person whose heart and lungs have stopped functioning. The timely application of CPR has been credited with helping save thousands of lives each year in the United States alone. This training program is not a substitute for attendance in a recognized CPR course. The information contained in this program is a guide to be supplemented with formal classroom instruction and practice. There are three basic techniques in teaching CPR. Each is based on a general human size and weight and is taught in age grouping. There is CPR for infants, there is CPR for children, 
and there is CPR for adults. Basically, the only difference between the three is the number of breaths per minute and the depth of compression. This training will focus on the adult CPR. Unlike rescue breathing, which is mouth-to-mouth -mouth or mouth-to-nose resuscitation, CPR requires use of circulatory techniques to keep blood flowing in the victim's body. The resuscitation part of CPR requires 12 breaths per minute, or one every five seconds. The circulatory portion requires a compression depth of one and a half to two inches and about 120 compressions per minute. Assess the situation before starting CPR. Is the person conscious or unconscious? If the person appears unconscious, tap or shake their shoulder and ask loudly, are you okay? If the person doesn't respond and two people are available, one should call 911 or the local emergency number and one should begin CPR. If you are alone and have immediate access to a telephone, call 911 before beginning CPR unless you think the person has become unresponsive because of suffocation, such as from drowning. In this special case, begin CPR for one minute and then call 911. The ABCs for CPR are A for airway, B for breathing, and C for circulation. A key action for successful resuscitation is immediate opening of the airway by positioning the head properly. It is important to remember that the back of the tongue and the epiglottis are the most common causes of airway obstruction in an unconscious victim. Since the tongue directly and the epiglottis indirectly are attached to the lower jaw, tilting the head back and moving the lower jaw forward lifts the tongue and the epiglottis from the back of the throat and usually opens the airway. Head, neck, and back injuries should be suspended in victims who have sustained a violent force such as from a car crash, a fall, or a sports-related injury. If you suspect the victim may have a head, neck, or back injury, minimize movement of the head, neck, and back when opening the airway by performing as much of the head tilt, chin lift technique as possible without moving the victim. Open the airway by placing one hand on each side of the victim's head. Grab the back of the lower jaw next to the ears and lift with both hands. If the lips close, Open the mouth with your thumb by pushing back the lower lip. If mouth-to-mouth -mouth breathing is necessary while you maintain the jaw thrust, sweep deeply into the victim's mouth with your finger to remove any foreign object. Close the victim's nostrils by placing your cheek slightly against them. You may also use a breathing barrier, which is the preferred method of rescue breathing. Prepare to give two rescue breaths. Take a breath. Make a tight seal around the victim's mouth with a breathing barrier and exhale. Watch for the victim's chest to rise. Allow the victim's lungs to deflate between breaths. Take a breath and exhale into the victim's mouth again. Then begin chest compressions to restore circulation. Place the heel of one hand over the center of the person's chest between the nipples. Place your other hand on top of the first hand. Keep your elbows straight and position shoulders directly above your hands. Use your upper body weight, not just your arms, as you push straight down on the chest two inches. Push hard and fast. Give two compressions per second. Continue CPR until there are signs of movement or until emergency medical personnel take over. We've discussed the need to treat for shock and how to provide rescue breathing for CPR. Another type of emergency first aid is heart attack, which is the major cause of death in the United States. A heart attack victim may feel persistent pain or heavy pressure in the center of the chest. The pain may extend to the jaw, neck, left shoulder, and left arm. The person may feel a burning in the chest, similar to a feeling of indigestion. There may be sweating, nausea, vomiting, unnatural paleness, shortness of breath, or difficulty in breathing. Look for pain that lasts more than three to five minutes or that goes away and comes back. If a person shows any sign of these symptoms, place the victim in a partly reclining or sitting position. Do not wait for the pain to go away. Call 911 or the local emergency number for emergency medical assistance immediately. Loosen tight clothing at the neck, chest, and waist. Keep the person calm and comfortable warm but not hot. Do not allow the victim to move around. Do not give stimulants.
If the victim is not breathing, give rescue breathing. If the person suddenly collapses and loses consciousness, try to awaken him. If the person cannot be awakened, and if there is no breathing or signs of circulation, begin CPR. The preferred equipment for dealing with a heart attack victim is the Automated External Defibrillator, or AED, but you'll probably have to wait until the arrival of ambulance personnel, so in the meantime, you should be using CPR. Heavy bleeding can kill a victim in a short time. If a large blood vessel is cut, the person can quickly bleed to death. Fast action is essential to stop severe bleeding. Treat all blood as if it were contaminated. If possible, do not use bare hands to stop bleeding. Always use a protective barrier. Always wash exposed skin areas with warm water and soap immediately after caring for the victim. The following equipment should be included in all first aid kits and used when giving first aid to those in need. Disposable gloves to be used when controlling bleeding or dressing wounds. A breathing barrier for performing rescue breathing or CPR. Plastic goggles or other eye protection to prevent a victim's blood from getting into the rescuer's eyes in the event of serious arterial bleeding. Antiseptic for sterilizing or cleaning exposed skin areas particularly if no soap or water is available. To stop bleeding, follow these steps. With a clean cloth or sterile dressing pad, use the palm of your hand to apply firm, direct pressure over the wound to stop the bleeding. If no gloves or clean cloth is available, use your hands. Wash them first if possible. While pressing on the wound, raise the injury above the level of the victim's heart if possible. Press firmly on the entire wound without releasing pressure until the bleeding stops. If bleeding does not stop, add additional dressings and put pressure to the nearest pressure point. If the dressing becomes soaked with blood, put a fresh one over it and continue pressing. You can further slow the rush of blood by using the flat parts of your fingers or the heel of your palm to press on the pressure points in the victim's groin or armpits. When bleeding stops, secure the pad firmly. Use wide bands of cloth tied snugly but not so tightly that they cut off circulation. If the bandage is on the arm or leg, periodically feel for a pulse farther out on the limb. If there is no pulse, loosen the bandage slightly. If the bleeding is from an arm or leg and cannot be stopped, use a tourniquet only as a last resort. Treat for shock and send for emergency medical help. Tourniquets should only be used when a limb is severed or so badly mangled that you cannot stop heavy bleeding any other way. Use a 2-inch strip of cloth or belt and tie it above the wound. Make a note of the location of the tourniquet and the time it was applied to the victim's body. Tourniquets should be loosened after 5 minutes to determine if the bleeding has stopped. If the bleeding continues, reapply the tourniquet and loosen every 5 minutes to see if bleeding has stopped. If bleeding has stopped, leave the tourniquet in place, check and apply medical aid to other injuries. A poison is a drug, chemical or toxic liquid that can cause illness or death if swallowed. Any drug or medicine can be poisonous if not taken according to a doctor's instructions or the directions on the label. Many cosmetics, cleaning products, pesticides, paints and other household products also contain chemicals that may be harmful if swallowed. Suspect poisoning or overdose if a person who may have been around poison suddenly becomes ill, is nauseous or vomiting, or complains of a sudden burning or pain in the throat. A poisoning victim may be found unconscious, confused, or disoriented. If the person is not able to tell you what was swallowed, look for signs such as unusual breath or body odors, or odors on the victim's clothing or at the scene. Immediately call the Poison Control Center or dial 911 and describe the product, the amount swallowed, and what time it was swallowed. Follow their instructions exactly. To dilute the poison, give a half glass of water or milk unless the victim is unconscious or having convulsions. Maintain an open airway. Treat for shock and keep the victim quiet and warm. Do not induce vomiting. Vomit should be collected so that emergency personnel can determine what was swallowed. A poison victim should lie on the edge of a bed, and a child should lie across your lap. 
Vomit should be collected in a large bowl or pot. When a person vomits, make sure their head is lower than their chest to prevent choking. Each year in the United States, about 4,000 people drown. This makes drowning the third leading cause of accidental death. Most people panic when they realize they are drowning. They wear themselves out, struggling to stay above the surface of the water. Frantic, rapid, and deep breathing occurs as long as the head can be held above water. Breath holding begins as the victim sinks beneath the surface. After a time, the victim swallows water, vomit, and coughs violently. No longer able to hold a breath, the victim involuntarily gasps for air and floods the air passages and lungs with water. Unconsciousness and death follow. The emergency actions needed to save a near-drowning victim include these steps. Rescue the person from the water. Get to the victim as quickly as possible without unnecessarily risking your own safety. If you can, remain out of the water and reach for the person or throw out a line or use a long, rigid object such as a pole. As a last resort, swim out to the victim, taking with you a flotation device or other object that will help you both stay afloat. Start rescue breathing using mouth-to-mouth -mouth or mouth-to-nose technique. Begin as soon as possible, even before the victim is out of the water, if it can be done without risk to you. If a pulse cannot be felt after the victim is out of the water, check for signs of circulation for 30 to 40 seconds. If none is found, start CPR at once. If breathing is normal, treat for shock and to encourage drainage, lay the person on one side with the head supported on one arm. If the victim is unconscious, bend the upper leg to the knee to hold the drainage position. Restore body heat by removing wet clothing and wrap them in dry blankets. Get medical help immediately. Every near-drowning victim, even someone who needs little rescue breathing and regains consciousness at the accident scene, should be moved to a medical facility for further care and observation. For the past 15 minutes or so, we have been discussing the emergency actions and techniques for shock, CPR, heart attack, poisoning and overdose, and near drowning. This program was not intended to make you qualified as an emergency medical technician. We strongly encourage you to take an accredited course in first aid and CPR. This training will stay with you throughout your lifetime and could help you save a coworker, friend, or family member.